Yasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurudevena Maha Sri Chaitanya Menobistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutto Iswam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dati Swam Padanti Kam Ma Um Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasta Bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinam Yena Miste Sarasmati Deve Gorvani Pichari may never stay so soon, your body must yet be a day so tiring. Panchakalpa to Rubisja, Kripa said to pay, but ya, the Titanum, Pavane, the old Vaishnava, the old Namaha. Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gita, Harsi Vasati, Gorvaka Window, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Ooh. So we'll uh, speak a little bit about devotional service. We always speak about the ingredients of devotional service and the mood of devotional service. Let's speak about the principle of devotional service. Uh, devotional service is the only way to attract Krishna. And here, I'll read one verse. This is from the uh, first canto, chapter 5. Takwa sadharma charanam bhujam harer vajana pokya da pate tato yadi yatra kya babadram abhutamusha kim one who has forsaken his material occupations to engage in devotional service of the Lord may sometimes fall down while in the immature stage. Yet there is no danger of his being unsuccessful. On the other hand, an devotee, although fully engaged in occupational duties, does not gain anything. So here, this verse is somewhat of a concessionary verse, but it's important to understand that the power of devotional service once begin will eventually uh, reach fructification or reach perfection. Many people take up devotional service for different reasons. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, one who is materially distressed finding no relief from that distress in any activity, uh, may look towards spiritual circles for some relief. Somehow they come across the process of devotional service, become interested and start to pick it up. And that's called for the materially distressed, material, materially suffering. Um, then there's another person who is looking for pecuniary gain, monetary gain, material gain. They want to uh, take up spiritual life because they know that God is a proprietor of everything and he can give them uh, wealth, he can give them material facilities, he can increase their material amenities. So they're looking for these things through by coming to the Lord. Sometimes we see, even in some prayers, we see, my dear, my dear Lord, please give me my daily bread. But people pray for material things and they worship God as the main feature for getting material things. There are those who are inquisitive, curious, so they come to devotional service and they want to understand a little bit about spirituality. So they take up the process just to see what it's like, whether they're interested into it or not. They came out of a, a fascination, a curiosity, some maybe some sentimental attraction. And then you have the last group who are actually seriously looking for truth in life. They actually want to know what is the purpose of life and how to gain that purpose. 
and what do I have to do to gain that purpose? So they they are what we saw we say in the best position. Mm -hmm. The third and fourth one, the inquisitive, and those who are looking for the absolute truth are in a higher stage than those who are coming out of material distress or coming from some pecuniary or some material gain. But anyway, as Krishna says, uh, all four of these people, he gives them the term Mahatma. Mahatma means great personality. One who understands the goal of life, although they may not understand, uh, the activity, they understand, they've come to the right place. <laughs> they will eventually learn, gradually, if they stay to the process, what is the goal of devotional service? And what is devotional service? So sometimes we see within these categories of four people, especially the first three categories, there is some sentiment that is not fully connected to the goal of life. And therefore, after some time, due to maybe wrong association or due to getting fulfillment of material desires, they may fall down in devotional service. But this verse says there's no loss. Mm -hmm. Because again, eventually in good course of time, because they have planted the seed of bhakti, and because even they've done a little of the watering process of that seed, no matter what degree it is, there's something there. Um, they will eventually, again, come back to devotional service. Sometimes it takes another life to come back. Sometimes it takes two lives. Sometimes it takes more than that. Or sometimes they come back in the same life. But that's not the principle here. The principle is everyone will have a chance. They will always be in a position to achieve success. Here, Prabhupada goes on to say that in this material world, everyone has duties. These duties are given to us by simply by taking birth in this material world. There are duties to our family, there are duties to parents, our duties to the social environment, our society we live in. We have to pay taxes, duties to the country. We have <clears throat> duties to humanity, doing work for other beings like that. And the devas, <clears throat> they give us, they provide for the material amenities of life, such as rain, and sunshine, fresh air, the earth, all these things sustain our existence in this material world. So we have duties to the demigods. Um, there are great philosophers and poets and scientists who have provided information and guidance in these areas in our life. So we have some obligation towards them also. So when one comes into the material world, one has a lot of responsibilities automatically simply by taking birth in this world like that. But if one surrenders to devotional service, one can relinquish all the responsibilities to these different departments, different personalities, simply by surrendering to Krishna in full devotional service. So people who surrender fully and the obligations are relieved they may try still to fulfill a few of them but still they're not obliged to because as one verse in the 11th canto srimad bhagavatam says devarshi putatma nirnim pritrignam nakinkanarayan ridhi charajam sarvatmayam sharanam pramanyam tato mukundan gri that in this verse it lists all these different categories of people that we have responsibilities. But Tato Mukunda, one who sur surrenders to the lotus feet of Sri Mukunda, then all these duties are no longer there. 
That is devotional service. That is the power of devotional service. Why? Why is it like that? Because the verse also explains that because all these duties on the material level are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord through his material energy. Just like one who, uh, one who has a million dollars has a hundred dollars, has a thousand dollars, has a ten thousand dollars. So one who goes to the top of all existence, Krishna, everything else is included. So one who fulfills their obligations to Krishna as Krishna's eternal servant through the process of devotional service automatically uh, these other responsibilities are no longer necessary. But then it says here that on the other hand, one who very enthusiastically works towards these other responsibilities, his family, society, country, humanity, and people in general, will um, ultimately they lose everything. Whatever success they have in these areas is lost in time. And at the time of death, everything is lost. So the, the, same, the, same, this, the verse says, what do they gain? They gain the hard, the hard activity or the hard work of trying to fulfill these duties, which are again lost in time and never perfect even while they're performing them. But devotional service is so glorious and so powerful that once it's begun, it will re it'll reach perfection in due course of time. Alpad mentioned some examples, such as Chitraketu. He had reached the stage of liberation and he was flying around in his airplane. And uh, he happened to come to the area of the demigods where there was a great meeting of many devas and the presiding deity or the presiding personality was Lord Shiva over the meeting. Lord Brahma was there and many of the great saints and devatas were also there. Um, Tritiketu saw something which he thought was got you quite a humorous. He saw that although Lord Shiva was presiding over the meeting of all these great sages, his wife Parvati was sitting on his lap. And so he laughed. He thought it was quite humorous. Um, Parvati noticed what had happened and she became upset. She called his attention. He came and she chastised him for his attitude. And she says, you think you know better than Lord Brahma and all these other sages. Um, Chitraketu didn't say anything. He just accepted her chastisement. And she was quite angry. Lord Shiva was observing the whole thing. And finally, you know, Parvati cursed him and said, you will take birth as a demon. So uh, he offered his obeisances to both Shiva and Parvati and uh, accepted what she gave him as his due, you know, he was, uh, he accepted it. Shiva was amazed to see how, how easily and readily he accepted it and he glorified the principle of devotional service that those who take up devotional service they are not fearful of any material situation because they're always fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion. So whether they're in heaven or in hell, it doesn't matter. They, they keep their mind focused just like a compass. It's always, it's always uh, synchronized towards the north. So in the same way, the synchronization of the mind and heart of a devotee is always fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord, no matter what material situation they find themselves in. And so Chitraketu later took birth as Vitrasura, a demon, and he wound up fighting against Lord 
Indra and the demigods, and he led the demons in a fight. Of course, it's a most wonderful story in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He could have defeated Indra easy, but he actually purposely lost the fight so he could be killed by Indra, so he could go back home, back to Godhead. He had the consciousness of a devotee in the body of a demon due to being cursed to take birth as a demon. But he never forgot the lotus feet of the Lord. And therefore, in that body of a demon, uh, he went back home, back to Godhead. So even though he had fallen from the position of devotional service, apparently due to his offense, um, he never forgot the lotus feet of the Lord because he didn't. He was, always, he was successful and achieved the ultimate goal of life of complete uh, devotion to the Lord and went back to the spiritual world. So that's an example. We have many examples. We have the example of Ajamil, who was a young man who grew up in a very pious and religious family, was never exposed to anything sinful in life, he was a very dutiful young Brahmin and man, and he also had a, a very nice young wife. He was married and uh, he lived very piously, but one day he happened to see something that he shouldn't have saw. He saw a sudra and a sudrani embracing in public, and his mind became disturbed by seeing that. The sudrani was actually a prostitute, and she was not dressed, what we say, properly, and therefore his mind became very disturbed. Later on, he actually chased after that prostitute, married her, had many children and committed so many crimes in order to support his prostitute wife. By the grace of the Lord and due to his previous uh, devotional service, he named his last child Narayan. Therefore, he was always calling his child when he was an old man, Narayan. And because of that, um, he was chanting the holy name of the Lord. So when death personified came in the form of the Yamadudas to take him away to, the, to be punished by Yamaraj in the lower regions, um, he called out Narayan calling his son, but he actually remembered the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, his calling purified him from all sinful reactions. And then he got the chance to take birth, or to go, not take birth. He continued his life and went to the holy place of hard work on the, bank, on the base of the Himalaya, Himalayas. Stayed there for 12 years and then he finished his life in pure devotional service and went back to Godhead. So these are some of the more outstanding and amazing examples of how, even though one falls from devotional service, the Lord will arrange some situation where the devotee will come back again and have a chance to pick up where they left off. So sometimes a person will leave devotional service and sometimes a person will accidentally fall down from devotional service. But in any case, Krishna never forgets any service that is done by the devotee and therefore he arranges a situation where the person again can come back and take up devotional service like that. This is the special mercy of the Lord. He never forgets. He's always grateful for anyone who renders any devotional service. And there are many, many other examples also. We have examples also in our own movement of um, one uh, sannyasi in our movement, he was a, uh, he worked under the guidance of Srila Prabhupada, preached in certain areas of the world and opened up those areas and temples started because of his preaching. But later on, he became a little bit contaminated by bad association and then uh, fell down from devotional service and actually left the whole process of devotional service. 
And then uh, for many, many years, actually, we actually say for decades, he was away from devotional service. At one point in his later part of his life, he came down with terminal cancer and he didn't have much time to live. So thinking about his position, he decided to come back to Krishna consciousness and finish his life out until he left the body. And so he came back. He wasn't able to do hardly any service, practically nothing at all because of his disease condition. But again, he took up the association of devotees. At one point in his devotional service, um, he was with the devotees laying in his bed and death came along. And as he was dying, he looked in a certain direction, his eyes became completely open and he exclaimed in a very emotional voice, Srila Prabhupada, you've come. And that's the last thing he said. And then that was it. The devotees could understand that actually Srila Prabhupada came to take him back in his last moments of devotional service. So this was a, uh, a glorious departure of this devotee who had done so much service for Prabhupada, opening up temples, preaching, traveling. Um, he even used to help Prabhupada cook, and Prabhupada would cook. Prabhupada also taught him how to cook, but somehow or other, I don't know the history of his life, but. He left devotional service and took up materialistic ways again in a very enthusiastic way. And so, but because he had done devotional service, Krishna arranged for him to get the mercy at the end. So, of course, we shouldn't think that I can do that. <laughs> These are situations where people do not plan to go back to material life and then plan to come back to Krishna consciousness. You can't do that. That is, that is a very bad mentality. It's a deviant mentality. And one will lose the mercy of the Lord. But somehow or other, due to some immaturity, or for some reason due to bad association, or some, some strong attachment to material life, one falls down again. Uh, there's no loss. One will get the chance to come back. So the beauty of devotional service is that the Lord never forgets the devotee. And the devotee can never forget the Lord, although he tries to. <laughs> it's just not possible. Okay, so these are some points we should think about. But one thing we should also understand that um, the process of falling down can also be explained. One is either one of two things can cause one to fall down. One, uh, offenses to Vaishnavas, uh, offenses also in general, but especially to Vaishnavas. If they're not rectified, then gradually one will lose the attraction for the process of devotional service. When one does that, one may try to look for some satisfaction, some association in the material realm. And then as soon as they do that, then their fall down becomes complete. So due to offenses. Another reason why a person may leave devotional service is they refuse to give up their material attachments. They cling desperately or strongly onto their material attachments, even though they understand that these things are blocking their process in devotional service. This is called Ridya, Ridaya Durlabhya, which is called weakness of heart. Weakness of heart means, I know this is an attachment, but I can't give it up. Or I don't want to give it up. I don't have the strength to give it up. So uh, that happens, and again, 
because we are social beings, we find ourselves in association of the material again. And that completes our fall down. So as soon as you take up materialist, materialistic association, again, then you fall into the material world. That's why Lord Chaitanya, when, when he was asked by uh, Sanatana Goswami, what is the first duty of a Vaishnava? And Lord Chaitanya said, Asat Sangha Tayaga e Vaishnava Achar. The first duty of a Vaishnava is to give up the association of the non devotees and take to the association of devotees. Because by association, this is where our progress develops and all our uh, anarthas will become purified by devotee association in that atmosphere. So these, these two things, uh, uh, strong attachment to the material desires and offenses to Vaishnavas, offenses in general, or mostly to Vaishnavas, can lead one away from the process of devotional service and gradually take up wrong association, which causes one to give up the whole process. Okay. So, okay, so we'll stop there. And uh, we'll see if any of the devotees would like to ask any questions. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. <coughs> I, I was wondering, uh, uh, connected to this topic, uh, when there are some cases when uh, devotees who, who left uh, ISKCON for some time uh, and come back. Uh, and it's, uh, it's probably very important how we behave uh, uh, with them. And uh, I just remember that there is this saying that uh, hate the sin, but not the sinner. And probably this is the best way how to, how to act. But uh, I was just wondering how, how, we, can, how we can make, uh, um, uh, make yeah. it this thing. Uh, this yeah, you, should, you should think that it, I could also fall down. So why should I criticize someone else? Mm -hmm. Prabhupada used to say it's... Um, it's first, it's third class to fall down, it's first class to get up. So they're glorious because they've come back. Therefore, we should welcome them back and congratulate them for, for coming back instead of looking at them in terms of why they left. That shouldn't even enter our mind. You should think, oh, this person is glorious. Really? That's the uh, that's the proper understanding. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the proper understanding. We're so happy that they're back. We don't even think we don't even care that the fact that they left, the fact that they're back, that's all that really matters. Yeah, it's very nice, and uh, I also had some uh, some ex experiences when. Someone who came back uh, did such a nice uh, service for Krishna after that, and and uh, so amazing personality is just uh, somehow I uh, it's it's a bit uh, difficult for me to overcome the feeling that uh, uh, I also compare others to myself and uh, and I just feel that uh, devotees uh, so nicely welcome others, but uh, sometimes they they uh, I. I have some experience when they don't act nicely with me and uh, there are some, there is some uh, how to say uh, I've been hurt sometimes and I cannot uh, um, so I, I connect to these and and uh, that's why I it, it's difficult for me to to um, to honestly be to happy 
We have to learn to tolerate. And we, if we're finding that there is a certain association that is causing us some unpleasantries, then we just try to avoid that association, that's all. And we can also look within ourselves and see what is it, what is about ourselves that can, can be corrected that is causing other people to act that way towards us. Yeah, yeah I, I just feel I really should uh, uh, learn to put into practice this Trinada Pisuni Chinaverse. My life would be much easier, <laughs> I think. Thank you very much. That's the king of all verses. Yeah. Because it really gives you the mood of, of execution devotional service. Mm -hmm. It's practice, like every like most things in devotional service, it requires continual practice. Mm -hmm. But when we find ourselves for some reason uh, people are finding fault with us or for whatever reason, there could be different reasons. Sometimes we find that there is just a clash in personality. There are certain personalities that automatically don't get along. This is, it's a personality thing. You see that everywhere, even in the material world. There's, uh, a certain type of personality won't get along with a particular type of personality. It's just a personality thing. But that, that shouldn't be a factor in devotional service. You have to get beyond that. But if that's there, sometimes we, that's why it says one should take association with like-minded devotees, those who have similar natures. That's Rupa Goswami. So one who has similar natures, we should seek out their association because we find it's easy to associate with them like that. But if you're in a general body of devotees and you're associating more in the group, then at the same time, you just go on with your service. And you may just avoid contact with certain persons who you feel will not, will not be, what we say, inspiring in your Krishna consciousness like that. You don't hate them, you don't hate them, you can see their good qualities, but sometimes there's some some personality thing or something that you need to, uh, you know, ad address within your own self. That's all. We all have that. It goes on. Even the senior devotees, sometimes they have trouble with each other for whatever reason. But they don't, they're not, uh, they don't, carry any enmity, they just avoid that association. That's it. And is it like this also in the uh, spiritual world? Because there are also groups, but uh, I don't know if uh, this is uh, because of uh, kind of similar moods or, or for some other reason. Yeah, it's like that. Like-minded people, just like they say, in the material sense, this is in the Bhagavatam, when you want to get married or you want to develop friendship, it should be based on similar likings and similar nature. So if you start off with a relationship, either through, through similar likings in nature, then you're starting off with a good, a good start. That's why that sometimes they would match up people for marriage based on astrological uh, you know, readings to see if their natures were the same or similar. Mm -hmm. yes, really makes sense. Thank you so much. Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Guru Krishna. Maharaj. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you. Uh, so just a, a follow-up question on, on, um, on this one. I, I was wondering if those who left this movement, how should we consider the association with them? 
you know, if you associate with those devotees and who practically left or hanging in some somewhere in the middle. Um, so how how do we consider the association with them? Is it a bad association or? Well, association is understood in, by the principle is if you take their association, you go down. If they take your association, they come up. So don't give your association to them, but to let them take your association. In other words, the association with people like that should be on the spiritual platform and not on the material platform. So the topics and the reasons for association shouldn't be something mundane or ordinary. It should be something that will be inspiring spiritually. Because the word association is translated in affection for. So if you have affection for a person, then you develop affection for their activities and their uh, ways of thinking and acting. And that'll bring you down. But if they develop affection for you, the way you think and the, your activities, they go up. So Prabhupada you would always say, give them your association, but don't take theirs. Yes, you, have to know, you have to know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I, I completely understand that. I, and I'm trying in some cases exactly to do that not not coming to their level and um, avoiding uh, uh, subjects you know themes that they like and they consider you know we should talk so yes uh, i completely now understand that yeah if you always if you're a devotee then you should be a devotee wherever you are <laughs> and whoever you're with It's not that you force people by a certain, you know, attitude. It's that you maintain your devotional consciousness and bring things around always in that mood. Like that. They will see you for who you are, but if you act differently, then they will lose respect for you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Sri Prabhupada and you. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. And I would like to ask um, uh, concerning a, a verse in chapter 5 Bhagavad Gita. And this says that the uh, renunciation of work and work in devotion are both good for liberation, but of the two, work in devotional service is better than renunciation of works. And although I um, read the purpose, yeah. Heard this um, on lectures a lot of times. I still uh, don't figure out. I think I can't at all understand this. I I understand some, but I, I don't understand. Um, Renunciation of work simply means giving up material activities. Work and devotion means taking up devotional service. So renunciation of work can lead to devotional service, but not necessarily. So that's the Gyanis. So ultimately, when out of the two, the uh, devotion, work in devotion is, is the goal or the supreme principle, that's all. So many people like give up material activities, but they don't, they don't take up devotional service and therefore they remain somewhat in a, what they call it. Uh, it's like you're in between. You're drifting back and forth because everyone has to be 
no one can do any no one can do not nothing for even a moment we're always active even if we're not active physically we're active mentally the mind does not stop so therefore you know just to give up material activities is incomplete mm. but that's a stage which can lead to taking up devotional service that's why it's given some credit in that verse Yeah. So just like Arjun, he says says to Krishna, what 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 what's the future of a man who who he's not in, in devotional service and he's not in material life? <laughs> Does he perish like a riven cloud? A riven cloud is a cloud that's driven by the wind. Whatever way the wind moves, the cloud moves. So Krishna says, no, anyone who has performed devotional service will never be lost. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, but if we're not giving ourselves fully to devotional service, then we're, we're still hangering in the, we're still lingering in the material energy. And therefore, we can't taste the happiness of devotional service. In order for devotional service to have, develop a taste, you have to fix your mind on that completely. Although you may not be perfect in the execution of devotional service, although you may have material desires yet, these are incidental and extraneous. The most important thing is I want Krishna, I'll do whatever I can to get Krishna. As long as you have that mentality, then you'll be able to always be in the best position to get the mercy of the Lord. And if we're still looking towards material life for happiness, we're still playing with the material energy. We can't taste devotional service. We can understand it's something wonderful, but that's all we can understand. Hmm. It's like licking the outside of the honey bottle. <laughs> We need to get, we need to have them we have to be fully convinced that devotional service is the only goal in life if we're not convinced then we have to be convinced <laughs> that's our problem we still look towards material life for satisfaction for happiness for fulfillment and because we do that we, we remain somewhere in a, in a state between the two energies, going back and forth between material life and spiritual activity. There's no disqualification for having material desires. The disqualification becomes uh, apparent when we try to fulfill our material desires. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for this clarification. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Anyone else? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance. Anuradha Hare Krishna. <laughs> Anurad, are you still there? <laughs> Looks like we lost her. Okay, anyone else? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, can I have another question? Uh, yeah, I guess. Nobody, unless anyone else is ready for questions. I don't, I don't see anybody. Hare Krishna. There's Anurada again, she's back. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Anurada here. 
Uh, yeah, because my Wi-Fi is very bad here. I'm in the... Um, uh, from, and, but I'm trying... Um, I would like to ask... Yeah, I remember this word in Bhagavad Gita, which is said that... Um, um, that you... you Anuradha, you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place, and your your network is cu cutting out. You have to change locations in order for you to speak. So a most abominable thing. Go to a low, better location, <laughs> or shut shut off your video completely. But still respect a devotee. I don't know exactly. Um, Radhavi Nodini, what was your question? Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, um, it's connected to a, a part which I read uh, yesterday in, in the last chapters of uh, the 10th canto uh, of Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, there is, in the purports, there is a quote from uh, Kena Upanishad, which I, I don't really understand. And I uh, thought that uh, maybe I could ask. Uh, it says that whoever denies having any opinion of his own about the supreme truth is correct in his opinion, whereas uh, one who has his own opinion about the supreme uh, does not know him. He is unknown to those who claim to know him and can only be known to those who do not claim to know him. And uh, it was a bit confusing uh, for me that uh, uh, what it means that those who, who claim to know uh, Krishna, they don't know him, and uh, the opposite. Manusanam sahasreshu yastit yastit kin yatatam avisidhanam kaschid mangaiti tatvangaha. From the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, uh, those who take up devotional service, hardly one reaches perfection. And even those who reach perfection, hardly anyone knows me in truth. Also in the seventh chapter, he said, Krishna says, I know everything that's happened in the past, all that is happening in the present and all things that are about to happen in the future. I also know all living entities, but me, no one knows. Lord Brahma, he also says, my dear Lord, some people say they know you, but as far as I'm concerned, I know I don't know anything about you. So these statements, by, both by the Lord and by the Shastras and by great souls indicate that, you know, to know Krishna is just, if we can know something about Krishna, that's considered to be success. <laughs> Krishna is so great. So we might think, well, I know something about Krishna, but <laughs> I, I was you, just you wondering. May have, you may have heard something uh, that you from a spiritual teacher, which tells you something about Krishna. So that doesn't mean does it mean you know it just because you heard it? <laughs> uh, so. Uh... It was, but I, I just don't understand that there are so many books from Acharyas who, who wrote about Krishna, and uh, it's even true but, for. Uh, but you, for, you won't get, you won't find any of the Acharyas saying, "I know Krishna." <laughs> you won't find that. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this this makes sense. <laughs> Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, I'm standing on the ocean of the shore of the devotion to Lord Chaitanya, and I'm trying to taste just one small drop of that ocean. If I can just mm -hmm. taste one drop, then I can drown in love of God. Not to speak about the whole ocean. <laughs> Krishna is so great, yeah. it's impossible for us to understand him. But if he wants, he can make himself known to his devotee. That's how the process worked. Mm -hmm. You can read books, 
you can study, you can perform penances, you can chant, you can give in charity, you can stand on your head, you can do so many things. But unless Krishna reveals himself, it's all useless. He's asked, there's also that verse from one of the Upanishads, Lavyo Prabhachanena, he says, not by you know philosophical study, not by great intelligence, not by so many things. He goes through a whole list. Can one know me? Only when I give, when I let them know, they know me. <laughs> That's all. Mm -hmm. So you have to get the favor of Krishna. When Krishna gives you the favor, then he lets you know a little something about him. Mm -hmm. And whatever little bit you can know, you should understand it's just insignificant. Wow. It just really struck me all the time that how much uh, this, this uh, process of learning is how a living process. So it's not like I read something, like reading something material and, uh, and uh, it's so mecha mechanical, but, uh, but spiritual and knowledge works how totally much do we different. Know? Like. How much do we know about the demigods? <laughs> what to speak about Krishna, who is the source of the demigods? How much do we know about what's going on in our own body? <laughs> Even that's a mystery. <laughs> yeah. So our knowledge is very, very insignificant. <laughs> but if Krishna wants, and he does, he reveals himself. As he says, Oh, he says to Arjuna, only by devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you. And thus you will understand the mysteries of my, under thus you will know the mysteries of my understanding, of my existence. That's in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, text number 55, I think it's 54 or 55. And Krishna says, uh, you know, so many times in the Gita, he says, you can't know me. <laughs> it's just not possible. But I'm known by devotional service. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. We have a, a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Friendly. probably. We have to put the uh, effort into it. Yeah, it's nice. Just learning about Krishna is a, is a just it's an experience in itself. We get the theoretical knowledge. We get a little once in a while. We get some realization, but it's just just this little drop. That's all. Yeah, but it's also uh, nice to know that uh, it's never ending. <laughs> so we can we can do it all yeah. the time. Krishna is so great and says that he doesn't even know his own greatness. He says that, and that he's always increasing in greatness and therefore, and he's also increasing in knowledge. So as his knowledge is, his, his greatness is increasing, his knowledge also to know himself increases at the same time. But his greatness increases more than his knowledge. <laughs> So as he gets greater, his knowledge catch up, catches up, and then his then his greatness again surpasses his knowledge. <laughs> Krishna he actually actually amazes himself. He's so he's just so wonderful. <laughs> he walks by he walks by he walks by a pillar that is reflective. And as he goes by, he says, Ooh, who's that? Hey, that person's really so beautiful. And he goes back and takes another look. Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so he becomes Lord Chaitanya in order to get a little better understanding of himself <laughs> through Radharani's bhakti. She knows more about Krishna than Krishna knows about himself. <laughs> So therefore, you take shelter of Radharani, and Radharani will help you. It's very sweet. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay, is there anything else? Govardhan Leela, did you find that verse I was referring to? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisance to all glory to Srila Prabhupada and to your holiness. Yes, I, I did. I started to read it yesterday. And it almost looked like a contradiction in one place and in another place. You know, I started family life, family life, 714. And uh, number, so verse I, number, I, number nine. Let, let me, let, yes, yes, I was reading it. And it makes exactly perfect sense the way you said it, um, that we should treat... Um, Animals as if they are our children. You did say that. And um, so that's, that's exactly how I'm going to uh, take care of the puppy that I have in the house, who is trained and does not <laughs> cause, me, cause me problems. I just, you know, I have a lot of devotees who really get on me about that, you know, and at this point I can't, I can't change it. I've made the I made the decision. I took the puppy from a cousin and and uh, very very nice. But I know that if I have deities in that in a particular room, that I should not have. Um, I should not have the animal near the deities. If that that's my understanding, correct? I have to put them in another room, put her in another room rather. But I, I'm very kind to the animal. I, sometimes I get frightened, you know, they keep telling me, well, you can't love that animal too much because you might end up coming back as, as an animal, you know, as a dog in your next life. And that's, you know, that scares me. I, I believe that when- That, that could happen. That, oh boy. Yeah, we have the example of Bart Maharaj who was a great soul, he got he developed an affection for a deer. And at the time of death, he thought of the deer. And then he took birth as a deer. So yeah, you have to make sure that your, your devotion to Krishna is foremost. You see all living entities as part of Krishna. And that's how you take care of others, that they're, they're spirit beings like that but if you develop a, a sentimental attachment to anything in this world based on bodily relationship then that could cause that will cause you another birth guaranteed and you might also be a nice puppy in your next life oh boy <laughs> well, so yeah, i'm sure you'll be I'm, I'm sure you'll be a good looking puppy anyway <laughs> Guru Maharaj, I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm I'm not going to let the creep the creature suffer by giving giving her away. You don't have would... to give it away. You just have to make sure it's it's you uh, have an area that is somewhat separate from the rest of the house, and uh, you have to realize that animals and humans cannot develop a relationship because. It's not based on the same principle. Humans can develop relationships based on their similarities, but animals can't. They become symbiotic and they simply depend on you and you take care of them. That's well, all. 
but, but you don't you shouldn't think what am, what is this animal giving to me you should think what am i giving to this animal okay. if, if krishna has given you that animal to take care of then take care of it but it's not like your husband or your children you know like uh, you would treat your own children in the same way would be different but at the same time you don't neglect that animal you don't mistreat it you provide it for what it needs because it somehow or other uh, it came under your shelter but that's okay but you have to be careful because we have the example i didn't read that but it's here in the same purport of the verse we spoke about how Bart Maharaj they developed, it. I mean, yeah, an attachment to a, a deer in his next life because he he gave up his spiritual practice and, and put his all his attention around that deer in his next life. He had to take birth as a deer. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Yeah, I've always had a lot of uh, animals. I've had like seven or eight birds, you know, and I've taken care of them. And probably because I don't have children, I think I, you know, I have that instinct to want to care for them. And uh, that, that's exactly correct. That's the, that's the actual reason. But even if you have children, you can also take care of you know the lower animals but you have to understand that taking care is simply taking care of them you know you develop bodily affection for them then there's your there's where the attachment develops they have animals they okay. have, you can you can yeah. give them you can give them prashadam you can let them hear the chanting of the holy name or kirtan, and then they will gain some some spiritual advancement. And then, in their next life, they'll take birth as a human being. Yes, I do chant uh, with the dog. I chant with the dog there, and uh, I do try to give her some prasadam. You know, I'm dealing with a non-devotee in the house also, so that, it's tricky. Yeah, okay. Um, but give your affection to the, give your, give your heart to the, the association with devotees. That's where, you, that's where you'll find fulfillment and spiritual advancement. Yes. Loving the devotees means loving Krishna. Serving the devotees means serving Krishna. Yes, I'm trying. I'm working on, uh, did you get my letter? I sent you a letter yesterday. So I, uh, you I'll, probably might I'll, not have gotten to it yet. Yeah, I'll get to it sometime soon. Okay. But I, I thank you very much uh, for explaining this. I've had this explained to me in different ways. And sometimes, you know, the devotees, I, I can't leave the animal alone. And sometimes I want to bring the animal to their home because I can't leave it alone for hours and hours on end. And they won't allow it. You know, I have to leave the animal outside and it's pouring rain and things like that. I said, that's not kind. I mean... But they said, no, we cannot allow the animal in the house. So um, I don't know. I've never run across this before. So I'm, I'm trying to look at it spiritually and trying to understand this. Um, you, just have to make uh, the prop, you just have to make the proper material arrangement. That's all. Okay. So it doesn't, well, doesn't overlap in your spiritual life. That's all. Okay. Well, I'll do the, the very best I can. And um, like I say, I, I have so many things to learn. It's just unbelievable. But, oh, <laughs> just, yeah, I'm so, oh, I have so much. I, I always, I just often wonder what, how many births will I have to take before I get it right? 
and, better, and it's not you better, that I'm, you better finish up in this birth because this is this is what you promised you said this person you gotta go back to god and so don't cause your spiritual master any trouble by making him come back again so finish up no. in this life <laughs> okay i will do that thank you very much dear maharaj you have thank the you, very much. you have you have the uh, facility all you have to do is take it learn how to take advantage of it the most important thing is to chant the holy names of the lord with devotion and to associate with devotees who are spiritually advanced. I'm, I'm trying to, to seek out good association. That's and most, um, yeah, yeah, sometimes I have, yeah. Yes, there are some, some I've been, um, and i working on that with Monty G's. Yes, I'm working on that. Good. Join this uh, discussion group that they're having in uh, in uh, with Mother Lavanya. I was on it yesterday. I love it. Okay. The Chaitanya Chaitanya. I love that class. Yeah, I forgot it's... to mention her name, Guru Maharaj. I'm sorry for that. Yes. Yeah, she... <laughs> good. Good. Yes, I appreciate. Yes, we have to keep that class going too. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so I have to leave. I do have an appointment in about five minutes. So thank you all very much. And we'll continue on the subject of devotional service, uh, explaining it and discussing it from different angles of vision tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. If, you want, if the devotees want to read ahead, uh, I'll be doing the next verse in the Bhagavatam. It's Canto 1, Chapter 5, verse number 18. We'll do that tomorrow. And so can you, if you like, you can read ahead about tomorrow's discussion. One quick question, please, if I may. You mentioned in the 11th Canto a particular verse, Deva Rishi, it began like that. Would you please tell me which chapter and which verse is that? Do you have a Bhagavad Gita in front of you? Yes. Uh, open up to uh, chapter 2, verse number 39, I think. And look in the purport. I think the verse is listed there with the reference. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank it's, you. It's 11th Canto. Um, I think it's chapter 5. But it's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Devarshi is the first word. So you can look it up. They are she. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Bosh, Vishali. Okay, thank you all. I have to run. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna.